So we'll start with, uh, I believe, the call to worship. So let's uh, come before the Lord as we uh, gather. Would you stand as we uh, come before the Lord and hear his word from Psalm 97? All right, where, where's the lights in the fog machines? That's what I want to know. What's well, <laughs> <laughs> going on with the lights? They're not there yet. They're not there yet. You know, you know, okay. you know okay. what it is? We need those slipping box so that they, when they come in, they can drop That's some right. money in there. That's maybe. Right. maybe. <laughs> yeah, get that, get, that yeah. Engine, get that engine humming at idle at least. You know, we can get that stuff. Okay, so the first thing, that's Pastor Ron, and uh, the first thing he does is he picks up the Bible, and he's going to call people to worship uh, through the Word of God. So, yeah. why? Psalm 97. Why? Um, because we're going to meet with God. God is summoning His people to His throne. Mm. Like, to gather with the angels and glorified saints. And He summons us through His own Word, through typically, I mean, if you read Psalm 95, you know, first handful of verses, 99, 100, 97, and they're just beautiful addresses of God, or the psalmist to God, but really in God's sovereignty and providence of God to his people, whereby he is the, the one speaking. So that's like the down, God speaking to summon us for worship. And it's it's beautiful. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's reading that, or I read it, but who are we? It's God through the office of the ministry, through his word, like addressing his people like to worship. And, and I, don't, I forget what... Uh, Joel Osteen's wife said there was like a transformation taking place or mm-hmm. shifting, a shifting. shifting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that, that like that there's a shifting that takes place from, you know, taking on the chin in the world or battling your own sin or struggling in this life or thinking about like, you know, what's going to happen in the week to come mm-hmm. to where you're being redirected to look up to God and to lift okay. your heart and, and, and your eyes to God because he's directing his voice to you and commanding you to do that mm-hmm. and calling you to do that. And receiving you to do that, even though you've sinned and stumbled and haven't been perfect, like he still calls you to receive you and to love you. Um, but you, what would you add That's to good that? Stuff. Yeah, the only thing that I would add is that it, it, this is the model that we find throughout the scriptures is that it's God who calls. It's God who creates covenant with people. And in these covenants that he creates with his people, he's the one who is God over them and he has placed them as his people. And in, in his place, he speaks his word. And we see it in Genesis with Adam and Eve. We see it with Israel on Mount Sinai. We see it with Solomon in the building of the temple. We also see it with, um, we see it in Hebrews uh, 12. And then we also pick it up in Revelation when John is cast up in his great apocalyptic vision. And it's, um, he encounters Christ in all of his glory and he's, he falls to the ground and, and, and he gets words of comfort nevertheless. You know, he who holds the keys of, of life and death um, assures him that he who was and is and is to come is the one who's summoning him. And he's coming to, yeah. to cast his eyes into this holy realm of this this heavenly picture of what is taking place as we speak, as we currently, right now as we speak, that in this heavenly realm, God is being worshipped, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. being worshipped, and all of the, the saints, um, all of the heavenly hosts are there worshipping us, and we join we join with them um, on Sunday as we, we, we summon this Mount of Zion to give worship to Him. So mm-hmm. I think it's only appropriate that we begin with God's Word. And again, even though these are, these are instruments, vessels, we can use the language of the New Testament, Paul talking about um, jars and whatnot, that's what, what's going on, but it's, that's not the point. The point is that God is speaking, God is the one who's doing it one who's summoning. Right, right. Yeah. Good, good. What's next? The response. <clears throat> so in the reading of God's word, let's rejoice in song together. Songs there in your bulletin. Please put up your hand if you haven't got one or go back there. Make sure you have the, the liturgy there. Let's sing together. Okay, so that's right after the call to worship. And one of you talked about the rhythm, right? God speaking and, and the people responding. Um, is, is that is that the biblical precept that we're to be following? Yeah, I think John mentioned it, and and the pattern that you see for the corporate assemblies of God's people. I'm not talking about David going hog wild in his you know priestly garments and mm-hmm. almost exposing yeah, himself because yeah. he's got the Ark of the Covenant. But but the corporate assembly, even you see it in the garden with Adam and Eve. There's a word response, God's word, God's people respond, and then table fellowship pattern. And so that response of singing isn't narrowly to the call to worship, though it is. It's a response to all that God is, all that he's done, all that he's promised to do. It's the only proper response. And it's it's a dialogue. God is receiving our praise. Like the music is, or the words of the songs, 
are our address to God. He's addressed us through the call. We respond in adoration and praise, mm -hmm. thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I like that. You, you called it a divine chit chat before. Yeah, which is probably profane, right? <laughs> but it's a definitely it's good. It's a holy dialogue. Yeah, yeah, between God and His people. Yeah, and it's holy really on both ends. We can't just create our own words and own lyrics and own songs and own, you know, whatever we own prayers. Yeah, like you know, they have to pass the muster of being faithful according to the word. Right, right. Or or not, and you can have a huge church and just make people feel good, but that's really dicey. Mm. Because that's how people are going to relate to God. Yeah. Okay. Prayer of adoration. <clears throat> Let us uh, pray together. Our Father and our, our God, you are the King of all and uh, the King of glory. And we come to you as those who can stand this day in Christ. And so we rejoice in our Savior, who is the resurrection and the life, who is the way to you, the one in whom we rest this day the one who enables us to worship you and adore you and pray to you and praise you because you are our God and we are the sheep of your hand. So we thank you for our good shepherd who hears our voice. May we hear his voice and may you be glorified this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Hmm. You know, you probably don't like looking at yourself on the screen, right? But there is a... Um, there's an air of solemnity that you are exuding as you're praying, um, that, that you are representing the entire congregation as we collectively are um, adoring the God who not only created us, but redeemed us. And it, it sets, for me as a, as a parishioner, it sets the kind of the, the tenor for the rest of, of the, uh, the worship service, that, that I've come to worship God. I've, I've come to also receive His gifts. Yeah, but I've come to worship him. And before that prayer, often we would have this uh, invocation. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is an invocation? You know, it's it's comes from I think Psalm one twenty four, and and we say our help is in the name of the Lord, mm -hmm. or who made heaven and earth. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? I will say that, or the minister will say that, and then God's people respond. My help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And and the thing about God's name is who He is and his attributes and his character. And so what we're doing is lifting our eyes after we've been called and, and we worship, we're like lifting our eyes, we're invoking, we're calling upon this God who is worthy to be called on, who is the source of our trust and, and the fount of every blessing and the one alone who can, to whom belong escapes from death. Mm. And so we call upon him and then we pray and we adore him. Mm. And, and that is, again, it's the name of the Lord is like so loaded. It's not just you stub your toe and take the Lord's name in vain. It's like his love, his goodness, his mercy, his holiness. His, he's eternal, unchanging, infinite, like all these things. You could probably add a thousand more things, but that, that's that's the part of the dialogue. Like the Christian life, Luther said in his 95 Thesis, life of repentance. <laughs> okay, it is, right? Because we're yeah. constantly sinning, but it's a life of invocation. Are you calling upon God? And is the God you're calling upon, are you only calling upon narrow parts of his character of the blessing verses, hmm. the physical uh, prosperity verses, or the I have best things for you ahead in this life verses. Like you can play fast and loose with the word. That's a narrow part of the scriptures. Yeah. Like you want to call on the God who's who's revealed from Genesis to Revelation. And and it's important that that, that different aspects of his character are, are um, I don't quite know how to say it. How would you say it throughout the liturgy? Like different parts of his character are on display? Yeah. Or is that... Like cutting him into pieces. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe what's on display is at least like the 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 work of God in redemption is okay. on display. Yeah. I guess is the way that I would put it. Um, and 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 through the mission, through the mission of the triune God, through Father who has who has planned His great salvation, the Son who has come to be our Redeemer, um, to live a life we couldn't live to die death we couldn't, and to be raised up in glory as our hope of glory, and in the Spirit to bind us and unite us and to, to bring us into communion, and then ultimately with us um, giving praise and worship, I guess. So I, I would lay it out, something like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, good. Good stuff. What's next? Salutation. <clears throat> Love this Receive place. the Lord's greeting. 
to the church of God gathered in North Hills, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints, grace, mercy, and peace to you from him who was and who is and who is to come, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of kings of the earth. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Wow, salutation. You know, it's like um, a, um, a Unitarian or a Oneness Pentecostal should, um, should come into a worship service such as ours and say, I'm in the wrong place because this is so Trinitarian yeah. from start to finish. <laughs> For right? sure. And, and how important is that, that we, we don't forget that we, we worship a triune God? How important is that? Yeah. Um, just one thing about those words, because those aren't necessarily my words. Certainly North Hills is. But yeah. that's the way Paul greets the Corinthians and 1 Corinthians. And it's also wed to, you know, the words uh, in Revelation yeah. of the Apostle John, like in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so those are, again, that's God's word. Like, it's not me, hey, horizontal. It's a vertical God's greeting and and blessing, not greeting. It's his greeting of grace and peace to his people. As they come stumbling in sin, weary, ready to call it quits, ready to throw in the towel, they hear grace and peace is theirs from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Or you can go through the motions. Right? Maybe you stayed up too late the night before, and that's just, okay, check it off the list. Like, there's a part of God's people's heart that needs to be drawn near. And and the way to do that isn't <clears throat> by John and I trying to figure out what's going to get people involved. <laughs> like, what words, what, what's the theme this week that we're going to do? And then what secular song are we going to play to get them, like, tuned into this vibe? It's it's the dialogue that, that like, just hits it out of the park in the souls of God's people through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you've, you've been such a big influence in helping me appreciate that over the years. Um, what would you, what would you add to? As far as add to like the, the salutation portion or add to in what sense of adding? Just the way the Trinity works. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think Brian, at least adding to what you're saying, Brian, I think if anything, our worship, um, and, and even within reformed churches and even within Valley, there, this, these are areas where we can grow. We can continue to grow because the one thing that we're doing is we're coming to worship God for sure. But specifically, we're coming to worship the triune God. And like you're saying, Unitarians, um, uh, oneness Pentecostals, when they come in, they should know I have showed up at the wrong place. Mm -hmm. These people worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are triune through and through. It is saturated throughout, throughout the, the, from the call to the benediction that this is the one God, the one who is three. Father, Son, and Spirit, and I just think this is, in my mind, I guess uh, this has been a, um, you know, while I was um, studying at Westminster Seminary, um, down in, uh, the, the seminary down here in California, you know, I took a class with uh, Dr. Michael Horton, and we were doing, we, the class was theology proper, and we're learning about God, it's all of this, you know, very um, um, rich, and even sometimes very abstract and heady, mm -hmm. heady um, language, and it's just, it, my, my soul was being enriched through all of this uh, deep and profound uh, theology, but I, I, I kept asking myself, so what do I do with it? You know, what, what do we do with it? And how do we, it's not like, um, you know, um, some of the, the mothers that are, that are caring for three children throughout the week or some of our, our strong laborers out there that are just grinding away day after day. It's not like I can say, hey, read Dr. Horton's book or, or whatnot. And you know what um, uh, Dr. Horton had said, we teach them to worship. We teach them our theology through the way that we worship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's communicated in, 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 the, in being very thoughtful in what's taking place. And that the gospel, the word in a sense, the word of the, the gospel is, is, is throughout the, the, the entirety of the service. Mm -hmm. It is the rhythm of the service. And we also live in a time where, um, unfortunately, I would say that um, the liturgy almost becomes a liturgy of, like, um, of the sermon. And again, I'm not against the sermon. The sermon is like a, a, a climactic point in our worship service. But if anything, it's the liturgy of, of, of the Word of God that has come to um, fallen humanity, come to the saints that are broken, and uh, to the lost world. It's that Word, and it should be, it should be throughout the service. Right. If it, it, yeah, yeah it, should be, it should be just yeah. ran through. Um, yeah. um, that redemptive of string, that, uh, yeah. that scarlet string should be ran all the way through. Yeah. So, so if anything... Like you're saying, Brian, it should just be, it, it is founded and grounded in, in worshiping the yeah. triune God. Yeah. 
And and what you're saying is the the sermon could be an absolute stinker, but the liturgy is going to save you from that bad sermon. You're going to hear the gospel through the other elements if they're done in a more biblical way. Yeah. Some pastors hit a grand slam or a home run every week. Like I, pastors striking out and preaching heresy, or fall, that's not good, right? But let's yeah. say the pastor preaches like a single or sacrifice fly sermon, mm-hmm. sort of like baseball metaphors. Yeah, yeah. But it's not a home run. But at, at least it was somewhat faithful, but they, they, they encountered God in all his fullness from the call to worship to the benediction to where so much of the freight that has to be carried in many churches is this guy's personality or mm-hmm. his ability mm-hmm. to communicate or his ability to hit grand slam sermons and deliver mm-hmm. Christ. Praise God if someone's that gifted. Right. You know, but there, there's so much more there from the call to worship to the benediction that God wants to do through the ry- rhythms of, of, of the liturgy mm-hmm. to bless his people. Wow. Yeah. Good, good. All right. What do we do next? Confession of faith. Let us confess our faith this morning. We do so uh, from a summary of our church's uh, confession of faith. People of God, what do you believe? So it's not the one that Joel Osteen used, uh, but it's something that comes from, it's, it's a summary of, uh, of the Westminster, which is one of, uh, which is our doctrinal standard, right? Mm-hmm. The Westminster standards. Um, so how important is it that the people of God gather together, um, declare together what it is that they believe? I know you have strong convictions about this one. I, I can go. I talk way too much tonight. <laughs> go for it, John. Go for it. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's um, you know, we're we're coming to God, and we're also we're coming to God, receiving His Word, but we're also confessing what it is that we believe about God. And again, um, uh, this is where I think of like the outsider that comes in there, there to encounter. Um, the triune God, even in what we confess, what it is that we believe, and uh, as and you know, Jason is reading this, and um, I want to be careful the way that I walk around this, but but there, there's a part of me that says I, I love the Westminster, right? I took vows to uphold the Westminster. Yes. Um, I love it. It's a wonderful document. I teach the Westminster Shorter Catechism week after week, and me and the kids, we love it. Um, it's a wonderful thing. But I think when it comes to confession, there's a real part that. Um, what we what we're really doing is we're confessing our what it is that we believe about God, and as much as um, there's different um, aspects in the Westminster about baptism, about end times, about um, our relationship with civil government, um, a number of things. Mm-hmm. Um, there, the, there's uh, throughout the church we've normally confessed the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and in these statements we're confessing. Um, who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. And, and and it's not that we're just doing that. What we're also doing is that we're saying that we also are part of the one Catholic Church. Not Catholic in capital C, Roman Catholic Church, but that we're part of the universal. one universal church. Yeah. Yeah. That we are not just, we didn't just randomly drop into time and here we are, boom, we're on the scene and we say what we want to say. But really, we're, we're, we're tying ourselves with the, 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 the church. The church the ages. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, um, the reformers of old would talk about that. You're being um, nursed through, through your mother. Your mother being the church and 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 this is where we're nourished we're confessing and we're praying and it's really through these confessions that are from from the cradle to the grave mm-hmm. you know um, I, I think of one of our um, one of our members at Valley and you know I think of his grandmother she was a uh, 104 I believe when she when she moved on yeah. and the Lord called her um, yeah you know, she had left uh, the faith, had not gone to church in years, and, she, and this is specifically the Roman Catholic Church that she was attending. Nevertheless, um, in her childhood, she had, um, it just was part of those ry- rhythms that became ingrained in her, and he went to go visit her, and he was trying to share the gospel with his grandmother, and he started to say the Apostles' Creed. Well, you know, halfway through, she just started saying it, and he had no idea that she knew this, and you know, it kind of just, re- <clears throat> um, I guess it solidifies for me, the importance of what we're confessing um, as it pertains to our belief in who God is, even for this 104-year-old um, older woman that despite maybe a great sermon, maybe a great mass she went to, maybe she showed up to one of these, uh, to, to one of these displays where they're bringing in the secular music, what's, what, what is grounded in her soul mm-hmm. and in part of her is what it is that she is to believe about God. The most important thing yeah. that, that she believes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. And even in that confession, the, the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and the work of the Spirit, even though, I mean, I can say so much more about that, but nevertheless, that, that's right. what's uh, ingrained. So for me, I guess uh, my, my thoughts would be for the confession, it really should be something that we're confessing with the church, universal. Mm, okay. 
Okay. And, and to defend VPC, I mean, for the most part, we do the Apostles' yeah. Creed, uh, we do the Nicene Creed, um, the, the lion's share of the time, yeah. right? And the summary of the Westminster is really the cardinal doctrines of, of the Trinity and salvation, from what I remember. Um, it just happened to be the the same service I yeah. pulled everything from, and <laughs> we yeah, used yeah, yeah. we used it that day. So you're like the uh, apostles in the books; they make themselves look perfect. Like, yeah, I love yeah. the Trinitarian creeds, who God is and what He's done. Yeah. like those are those are gems. Dynamite. Those are gems. Yeah. yeah, good thoughts though. Yeah, yeah. I, I I never knew that, and that was helpful. That yeah. was helpful. Always reforming. I'll talk to the session about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's next? The response. Responsive. I need your arms around me. I need to feel your touch. I think that's cake. Do we do cake? <laughs> no. Oh no 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 no! We don't do we don't do oh, cake my song. Oh, my Let's go. I just pulled a fast one. No, we don't. But there is a response. What is the response? Glory to the Father and to the so it's the glory of Patrick, right? That's what we do as a response to that confession of faith, which is usually the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. Yeah. So that's that's how we're going to uh, you know, confess what we believe and then once again respond to what God has revealed himself um, to us through the word by uh, a song that proclaims the greatness of the triune. Oh, yeah. 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 It's and, and it's not just like an information song. Let's get the glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's actually, we're glorifying God as we do that. Yeah. And it's just very beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. Like we're actually worshiping the Lord. It's not just for show or because we do it every week. Mm -hmm. Like God's on the scene. Christ talks about walking among the lampstands. Mm -hmm. Like he eats that up. And certainly he's got the towel around his waist. He's washing our souls, you know, and bringing healing to us and comfort to us and changing our lives, as Joel Osteen says. But we're also doing a part in that, in that dialogue. So it's, it's a, it's a beautiful yeah, and just to add to that, um, yeah. you know the the Gloria. It's been it's been around for so long. You know, from the ancient church, medieval church to the Reformation, and even to this very day. You know, we're again. I think this is another part where, um, you know, I know there's concern that like, well, you're so fixed in in the past, and it's really not that. If anything, we're just we're only we're only doing what um, what has been passed on, and these great truths, um, and these um, great habits. I guess I would is the way that I would put it is that we're responding um, with um, highlighting the sheer fact that God is most glorious. And again, I think we're just joining in with the rest of the church, and specifically, even though um, when we think of like um, the angels that are surrounding God's throne and they're singing "Holy, Holy, Holy," in a real sense, we're trying to get, we're getting at that reality that yeah. we're, we've come. We're worshiping this most glorious one. Yeah. He is, you know, he is kavod. He is heavy. I think that the the the, the Hebrew word is kavod, just this this weightiness, you know, like a king. We've we come and we look upon him, and he's just so glorious. All mm -hmm. we can say is, "Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit." Yeah. It's only right. Yeah. Wow. I even think about the, um, and this only occurred to me recently that I've been saying the doxology all my life, right? Singing it. And yet, all of a sudden it dawned on me recently that we are actually calling upon the angels to worship Him with us, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, praise Him above ye heavenly host. Mm -hmm. Wow! I never really thought about that. Yeah. But we're actually calling the angels, calling upon the angels to worship God along with us. That's amazing. Beautiful. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> Okay, what's next? I, I, I forget our, uh, our form. Okay, confession of sin. This is an important one. I almost think sometimes we should start with this, okay? Because <laughs> I, I come in. I come in. Yeah, I, I come in all messed up sometimes. Yeah. I'm just all battered and, and barely able to, um, you know, barely able to keep myself together because, because of the week I've had. Maybe even that morning I've had before I enter into worship. Yes, it's such an, so well, God calls us that? to confess our sin. God is a holy God, and, and He does so from His Word, and from His third commandment. And we are guilty, very guilty, for taking His name in vain. We would be undone for eternity for taking His name in vain. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ has removed our guilt and our sin and, and, and commands us that we would go to God and confess our sin our distrust, our disobedience, our disregard for God's name. We take His name in vain when we pay no attention to His word as it's preached or when we fail to read it as we ought. We've all done that because of our pride. And so start there. Confess you think you know better than God, that you are God at times, that you live as you are God. And 
start there and repent of your sin for taking God's name in vain. Let's do that together silently before the Lord. Because that's harsh, you know. That's that's not going to make friends and influence people and get them to come into your sanctuary, you know. People want to hear that, but do we need to hear that? I think people love to hear that. I think it, it resonates with what they know to be true in their heart and their conscience. Certainly the Christian, right, spirit testifies that we're sinful and yet we can go to a merciful Savior and confess our deepest, darkest sins hmm. and still be received by God for the sake of Christ, for the sake of his blood and righteousness. But I think even if someone isn't a Christian, at least someone's speaking the truth. Like, who cares that that's me up there? Yeah. Like, the third commandment was given, you know, by God, you know, through Moses to God's people. And, like, taking the name in vain has to do with distrusting God. <laughs> Not just what you say when you stub your toe, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So how many of us struggle to trust God with our future, or with our loved ones, or with our station in life? All the time. And yet we, we don't come, like, cowering in shame and guilt. We, we confess with faith knowing that we're actually going to be received by God and we repent and turn and hopefully trust and obey a little bit more the next week. But yeah, it's, it's going to be God's word again, calling us to confession, convicting us. Mm -hmm. And that will, that res people may gnash their teeth and stone me to death or shoot me one day, maybe for the sake of the revealed will of God and his word. But a great many people will rejoice and it will resonate with their soul by the Holy spirit because they know it to be true mm -hmm. and they'll flee to this Christ. They'll know their need, and yet that will cause them to look outside themselves to a Savior who does forgive and cleanse and wash and assure. Wow. You got any thoughts, John? My only thought would be that I think, in, it, 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 again, I think it seems appropriate in light of the fact that if you look at the order of worship and the rhythms, you've just gone through the rhythm of adoring this glorious God and His greatness, and, and, and under the weight of that glory, there's a real reality that like that that should resonate with all of us that we are low that we have we have not loved not loved God not loved neighbor um, not loved the closest people to us not our, our very own children or our very own spouses um, we know that to be true and I think you're right and I think you're right in one sense that it isn't the most friendliest message it's not something people want to run to and yet at the same time I definitely agree with Jason there's a real sense of people people there's something deep inside of someone that says I know that to be true. Mm. I know that to be true, and and, and that's something that um, um, people need to hear. Um, and I think there will be a good many that will say, at least in in um, at least in one sense of saying, I can I can honestly um, say thank you for that. At least uh, smashing me before the weight of God's glory, in a sense, and and confessing my sin. Yeah. Um, and others will do that, but they'll also gnash their teeth and and pray for. For the rocks to fall on them as they try to hide from the the, the gloriousness of who God is. Right. Yeah. I remember uh, R.C. Sproul asking uh, a great question um, <clears throat> that we should ask when we are talking with unbelievers, and that's, "What do you do with your guilt? Where does it go?" Right. And and there's only a couple places it can go. Either either you suppress it, you know, you press it down, make believe it's not there, or you think to yourself, maybe I can work my way out of the guilt. Maybe I can, you know, do enough good to offset the bad. Or you can come before a holy God and just uh, do like you would if you actually committed crimes. You would confess them in front of a judge. But instead of the judge sentence, sentencing you for, you know, the punishment that you deserve, yeah. um, the, then comes the next element of the order of worship, which is going to be the assurance of pardon. To those who um, refuse to look to Christ, who would not confess your sin, you are taking the Lord's name in vain. He is a Savior. He is a merciful Savior. He's a holy judge, though, who will judge all those who don't believe in Him, who don't look to Him for forgiveness. Look to Him today. Otherwise, the wrath of God remains upon you. But to you who are trusting in Christ, you even who don't trust as you ought, who do sin and take his name in vain. God has forgiven all of your sin. He's washed it away. Hear the promises of God's grace and forgiveness to you from the prophet Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. It's only true of you because the one who 
kept the Lord's name, who obeyed in your place, in your flesh, bore his crimson blood, his scarlet blood on the cross that you might be forgiven. And Christian, I declare to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The record of your transgressions is blotted out and your everlasting salvation is hidden in Christ who will resurrect you on the last day. Hmm. You know, you are the first pastor that ever, um, in, in my hearing, uh, warned people that if they don't repent and they don't um, turn to God for the forgiveness of sins that they need, that the wrath of God remains upon them. And, and you're doing such a service to, to those people that, that didn't take that time to repent. And I've always appreciated that. Um, it, it's, it takes guts to do that, I'm going to tell you. Well, the whole issue is why Why do I do it? What What's the biblical basis? Where do I get off saying such mm -hmm. things? Those are hard words. Who mm -hmm. cares whether it's easy or hard? Like, who do I think I am to declare such things to people? It, it comes down to the keys of the kingdom that Christ has given the apostles and their successors. And he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Mm. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so the authority that I have as a minister is, is not magisterial, not creating commands and statutes mm. and promises, but it's ministerial. It's one who's under the word. Mm. And so if someone is looking to Christ for the forgiveness, I can loose and declare their sins forgiven. If someone is not looking to Christ, I can declare their sins are unforgiven. And the wrath of God, John 3, 36, you know, abides on those who do not obey the son. Mm. So... It's only biblical. like, And that's why there's any sort of power there. It's the Spirit working through the revealed will of God in Scripture to drive home His love and grace and assurance to His people, and then to warn those so that they eventually turn on their last breath, if not sooner, if not later that afternoon, like hopefully. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a sobering confrontation with God, yeah. not me and my opinions. It's God through His Word, by His Spirit. Uh, I don't know the prepositions, though. Like... From the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. Or I, I meant to I asked you about that off camera, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, nothing's coming to mind right now. For me. Yeah. Um, I, uh, the only thing I can add to, um, um, beyond this is that, um, you know, prior to, I think for myself and especially for my wife, my wife is a bit more like, um, uh, she's so wonderful, but, you know, she's, she has struggled in the past with just uh, knowing that God is, is, is forgiving and that, he's, that there's some assurance that she could have. And, mm -hmm. and I know there's many others that, that are like her, you know, as an elder and uh, caring for people. I know this is a, a question that constantly comes up. How do I know? How do I know? And, and you know, I think this is a, a wonderful part um, in, in the liturgy is that it's a word outside yourself. And it's a word that is coming. Yes, Jason is, being, is the one who's speaking it, or Ron is the one speaking it, but it's, it's not their word. Um, it is God's word coming that, um, that they're, they've been forgiven. And I, I know for my, for my wife, it's, in su it's such a blessing for her to, 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 for this portion of the service, for her to come to this, to just hear God's mercy is new, His grace is towards her, and that um, that he is a he is a good God, of course, through the work of Christ. Um, and it, again, it's just this outside word. Just because we tend to constantly look inside and constantly, how 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 um, how profound was my forgiveness, uh, my my repentance? Um, how sincere was it? And and out, outside of it, even with the with weak faith, with with little repentance, um, nevertheless, coming um, as as a sinner, seeking um, God's mercy. You, you, you hear this external word that God is favorable towards you, that His assurance mm. is upon you. It's mm. a wonderful thing. And, yeah. and then, where is it in the service? Like, toward the beginning, why is it there? Like, if you look at Exodus, when God gathers His people at Sinai, mm. one of the first things they do when they're summoned by God is they're throwing all these sacrifices, right? Yeah. No, when He flopped out of that ark, sacrifice, right? <laughs> right. Blood being shed. Right. Right. Cain's sacrifice not being accepted. There's some fruit of the vine. No, Abel's is accepted blood, body and blood. Mm. And so that's the very beginning. Like, look in the, uh, the dedication of Solomon's temple. Tons of sacrifices yeah. right after God summons them. Look at John, hopeless in Revelation 5. Who can open the scrolls? Oh, yeah. The lamb who looks like he's been slain. Like, sacrifice of Christ. Mm. And then, of course, they can enter into all the, the, the response to God's word and the worship and everything. So it, it's, it's a response to who God is and being summoned before his throne. Like, it should be toward the very beginning of the service that there's a call from God to confess, confess, and then a declaration of pardon based on 
you know, he himself bore your sins in his body on the tree, mm -hmm. that you might die to sin and live to righteousness. Like that first Peter one, so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by stripes, you've been healed. So you leave changed in the very best way, like comforted at least rather than, you know, uh, entertained. Right. Right. <laughs> comforted. And it's going to happen again in the service, right? With this, with the sermon uh, that does contain both the law and the gospel. Yeah. You're gonna, you, you know, there's, there's that, there's that portion of the of a good sermon for me, anyways. That I'm going to be laid low once again, you know, because God's word is going to convict me as it's being preached to me, and and yet the gospel, the sweetness of the gospel is going to come in once again, uh, center me to where I I need to be, which is in Christ. That. You know, everything that he did, he did for me, yes. right? For me. Yeah. Um, all his obedience, his love, his mercy towards others. Um, he lived the life that I should have lived. Mm. And, and I walk away at peace. But even then, God knows that that wouldn't necessarily be enough for his people. You just hear more promises. like, And so he delivers it a third time the charm at the table. Yeah. Where he gives you these visible signs and seals yeah. of his covenant of the blood at his own great personal cost of the blood of his own dear son that, that he he seals you with his love and gives you these tokens of redemption yes. and of course nourishes you spiritually yeah. at the table like seals that to your soul as you partake by faith like you're being nourished by you know christ himself truly hmm. and so it's not just the words and the bible verses there's like physical tangible elements that you you taste and see that god is good and for you yeah. And like like John mentioned earlier, the weak faith, the very weakest mustard seed faith, it's still assurance of pardon, uh, the sermon, oh, and that just convicted me more. Like I still come to the table, and that weak faith clings to a strong Savior mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who here, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood that was shed for you. Yeah. Do this in remembrance of me. And, and you're doing it participating spiritually. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's more than just words. He it's, totally jumped the gun. I know, right? That's oh, fine. You, you got him excited. But, yeah, you know what? Edit it out. You're beautiful. No, because no, you I, can't help yourself. It's all right. It's all right. I get I it. Watched it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Pastoral prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we gather as your people to pray to you, to talk with you, to plead with you, Lord, we are mindful as we've sung of your tremendous grace, grace beyond our sin, beyond anything we could do. Mm. So we pray a lot, right? And, and um, we talk about sin, and, and a lot of churches these days um, don't do either of those very much. Uh, the pastoral prayer, I mean, that's boring, right? For, for two or three minutes, we're going to hear about you know, the problems of the world, and we're going to hear about, you know, God, uh, we're asking God to intervene in the, in the affairs of our nation, and then we get a little bit, uh, the, the circle gets smaller, and we start talking about, you know, Aunt Martha's goiter that needs to be healed, and so forth, right? right. It's right. boring, yeah. but why is it important? It's the prayer of the church, you know, I think that's just the bottom line, it's the prayer of the church, um, though there's one person um, doing this prayer, he's not praying for himself, but he's praying on behalf of God's people. Mm. And if anything, we see it again. I think um, I think of Solomon as he's um, put together. They've they've come to this temple that they've just built, and Solomon one he's praying a prayer of repentance, but he's also praying a prayer um, on behalf of the, the the children of Israel. And I think if anything, this is just a prayer of the people. Mm. Um, we also see it in Revelation as well with um, the prayers of the saints that go before him. And, and if anything, we're just following in line with the rhythms that have been laid down for us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. Okay. So here's our offertory. We are, have been given so much. Boy, we have to think about that. We've been given so much, and we are called of God and included in the very uh, plan of God to give of what we have. And so give that heartily and from your heart, because the Lord has given you everything. Uh, certainly we give back to him in some way so that his church can be built, his kingdom can progress, and so people can come to know and love and enjoy him forever. Hmm. Yeah, so his kingdom can progress. That's, that's a really good reason to give out of, out of gratitude and thankfulness to God. Um, 
Now we do have, uh, you know, an offering that is given physically in the sanctuary as the worship service is occurring, uh, but we also have online giving, right? Um, but I'm going to petition that we get those neat little slots, okay? <laughs> At least a couple of them, right? The entrance and the eggs, because I think they're so cool. Those just slid in so nice. We'll okay. have to add in the smoke machines <laughs> next one. <laughs> okay, we're going to continue. Preach the word. I invite you to turn to the word of the Lord, to Acts chapter 21. Okay, now I, I mentioned that earlier, that, that I think this is what Pastor Ron does on the regular. Yeah. Yeah, I invite you to turn to the particular passage he's going to preach. And, and I want to say that both you and Pastor Ron are uh, tools, okay? That that's can be a bad connotation sometimes, right? And, <laughs> but it's a good connotation here because you, God likes to use means. And he's using the means of a fallible person that, that's been called to the ministry of word and sacrament to deliver his good word to people, right? That has law and gospel, and it's every week. Um, and I, I've, I've told you know, a lot of people this um, when they talk about the, the, the idea that church isn't such a, eh, it's, 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 not a um, it's not a non-negotiable that, you know, eh, if I miss a week or so, you know. And I, I, said, I said, you know, a week is just long enough to forget that I'm a Christian, yes. right? And, and start living like I'm not a Christian. And so it's, it's important to be refocused and recentered to come back and not only gather with, with the God's faithful and, and be strengthened by each other, but, uh, but, but to you know, experience these different elements of the liturgy and then to hear God speak to me uh, personally as he's speaking to everybody else, but it, it's, it's God's word to me as I hear it preached. Yeah. Um, so your thoughts on, on the importance of preaching. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate how he, he just, I mean, the, the word is going to shape the character of the community of God's people. Like both worship and then, of course, the word are going to shape people. And so it's good that he's calling God's people to turn in the word of God to God's word. And he's going to read a passage and then he's going to work through a passage. Command, promise, you know, Christ. Like and, and other things too, depending on the text. But yeah, um, you don't want to stray too far from God's word. Yeah. Even if you stick close to it and you're not like insanely gifted, which is a great majority of preachers, mm -hmm. like you're going to do all right. You're going to be faithful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, um, during the time of the Reformation, this is a pivotal part. You know, the reforming of this portion of the liturgy, the um, of the preached word, and um, you know. Before they even read, they would pray, um, pray for the Spirit to work through the Word, as we, we, we constantly say that the Spirit is working through His Word. And even like Jason is saying, even though uh, the preacher may not be an excellent orator or anything like that, but that the Spirit is going to work. He's going to work through His Word just being read, even it just being read out loud, and then, and then through the working through the text, you know, the, 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 Expositing of whatever whatever text, whatever genre the, the the minister is working through, trusting that maybe weak, maybe wonderful, maybe maybe they get a, a, an Apollos that shows up and he's just um, this great speaker, um, working through the Old and New Testament, t making connections you've never seen before, yeah. um, and maybe not, but nevertheless, that the Spirit is going to work through His Word. Mm. Yeah. All right, so what comes after the, the uh, preached word for us? The Lord's Supper. Okay, now you can go off. Come to the table for the Lord to show us once again how much he has loved us and how much he has done for us. That it's, he's done it all for us. Not some of it, not most of it, but all of it. All of it. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you said it before you said, you said how important it is because it, it really is the, um, kind of the addendum to the preached word because now it's physical, right? It's, it's a visible gospel that we can not only smell and taste, um, but, but we can see the gospel right through the, through the bread and through the wine, uh, the body and blood. And, um, and, you know, I've done some, uh, recently I've done some videos on, on the Lord's supper and I get a lot of, I get a lot of, um, comments on the way that I explain it when I talk about the fact that we as Reformed people believe in the real presence of Christ in the Supper. Uh, but we're not Roman Catholics. We don't believe in transubstantiation. We're not Lutherans. We don't believe that Christ is actually in the bread and wine, but the bread and wine don't change. We believe that the bread is just regular bread and the wine is just regular vino. And yet somehow 
spiritually, Christ is present, and not only that, he nourishes our soul uh, to eternity. Um, but, but for some reason, I, I, I'm always getting confused um, w- with people uh, that, that we're, we're leaning towards the Catholic or the, or the, the Lutheran idea. So maybe you could put it in your own words, um, how that works for the Reformed view. Yeah, um, I, would, I would say, like, why do we even have the Lord's Supper in the first place? Like, you see a word response table fellowship pattern in the corporate assemblies. Like Adam and Eve, hopefully, it would have been able to partake of the tree of life, right? If they responded well to God's command and word and faithful obedience. Mm-hmm. In Sinai, you see Moses and the elders go up and eat and drink with God. Like they see God. And then even with Solomon dedicating the temple, they're having this huge like peace offering chow down celebration. Like after that divine, that corporate assembly. In Revelation, there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. Mm-hmm. Like there's always a word response table fellowship pattern. And so what God's doing in the Lord's Supper isn't just like an empty sign. And it's not that the signs turn physically or, you know, in a sense, to the body and blood of Christ. Or that Christ's humanity is omnipresent. It's that as we partake by faith, I mean, our lives are hidden in Christ with God. Like, we're nursed. It's a participation. I think 1 Corinthians is at 10, 18. It's a participation Mm -hmm. in the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. As we partake, we're nursed spiritually yet truly and really by the exalted Christ, by the Holy Spirit. Mm. And and so it's not just we're remembering and looking back. There's like a present <laughs> chowing down and having God's love and grace sealed to our hearts, having our faith increased and strengthened by the Spirit mm. as we partake by faith. Uh, Very ordinary, meager elements. Um, you were just in seminary. I don't know. You studied this stuff like... Last last year, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, we're not downplaying the remembrance right aspect of the Lord's Supper. We are remembering the one time sacrifice of, of the Lord. Oh, definitely. Okay. okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, if anything, I think there's um, there's a, you know there's great mystery here as well in this in this situation. I think all of what Jason is saying is definitely I agree 100. Um, percent uh, If anything, I think there should be a, a further um, dependence in in the work of the Spirit. I think normally when we say that we're spiritually partaking today, somehow there's a confusion that um, the Spirit is almost like a lowercase um, uh, s that's being placed there, almost like my my uh, subjective spiritual state. Yeah. And really, that's not what's going on there. That we're what we're really saying is that something really mysterious is happening that the spirit that the the holy spirit is actually binding us to christ to the to the fullness christ to the full christ to the real christ um and and the 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 whole christ i don't know how else to say that you know there's a real work going there we cannot explain all those things um but it's a wonderful thing that we really are participating um and receiving all the benefits that Christ brings, and and ultimately being bound in in, in union and communion with Him. Right. Um, and I think um, to 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 go um, pull back a little bit and go a little bit meta on what's occurring here. Again, we I think when we look at the worship service, we're remembering that God has called us, and we have come um, summoned by the Father, and we have um, come. And we see that we're in a great um, situation of a need because of our sin, and then we're given words of assurance of pardon through through the one who through, through the through the Lamb who's been slain, and we come and we we're consecrated under the Word, and it's a wonderful thing. And now um, in this triune work, in a sense, um, the Spirit is uh, uniting us. Um, there's a uh, I want to say we can pull back from even the, just the preach word and just from the the message of the the structure of the liturgy. We're, we're given. This beautiful gospel and just the the, the redemptive um, workings that are all taking place that the Spirit is 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 uh, uh, applying all of the redemption um, worked in Christ to us to us weak weak mm-hmm. feeble faith He comes and He is He is just um, binding us to Christ. It's a wonderful thing, very mysterious. Um, nevertheless, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad we do it every week. Oh yeah, I'm really glad we beautiful do. Beautiful Okay. Yeah. Benediction. Please stand and receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Hmm. So it ends with a Trinitarian benediction, right? I'm wonderful. Yeah, and it should. Like a benediction is not a doxology. 
Like we sing the doxology, a doxology about God's glory from him to him through him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Those would be our words to God. Like the benediction, very important. That's God's word to us. Mm -hmm. And the number six one, even, you know, the one in Corinthians, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. You know, th those are God's words to God's people, God's blessing. Even the numbers passage says he's placing his very name on his people. Mm -hmm. And you think of his name, like his attributes. And in a sense, he's placed his name on us in our baptism, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's only fitting that he would do it again at the very conclusion of the service, that he would get the very last word. Yeah. Not like, I'll see you when I see you. You know, no, God's putting his name and his blessing on his people, giving them his good word. And so it, you don't want to confuse this or even this. Hey, pal, thanks for coming, blah, blah, blah. No, it's definitely God. Hmm. And it's a great good word. It's a blessing of a word. I'm like, give me that word. Like every, you know, yeah. when I hear that number six one, like I'm through the moon. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, this has just been great, guys. Um, and, and I hope for the, the listeners, the, the viewers that, that tune into my channel, uh, this has given them an opportunity to really understand what liturgy is all about. And, and the fact that every church has one, and it's either a, a biblical one or a not-so-biblical one. And we're just striving at, at Valley Press to be biblical, right? I mean, that's, that's really our passion. And we don't do it all right. Um, I'm sure there's areas that we can improve. Um, but, uh, boy, I really appreciate both of you, Pastor Jason and the Elder John, uh, coming out and spending an evening here instead of with your family to, uh, to share, you know, from, uh, from your, your studies and your, your learning and, and your heart, uh, these, these great truths. So um, I really thank you guys for coming out. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for all you do for the kingdom. Yeah.